So only in the last few years have I really started to recognize the importance of the words that I use, the words of the people around me. They're really, really important. And being a songwriter, as I've written and rewritten and edited and edited and edited songs, to try and get a message across in about three minutes, for sure under four minutes, I've really had to focus on what the purpose of my music ministry is and to try and condense that into these short snippets that hopefully will empower people, um, inspire people, motivate people to be an expression of peace in the world, because that's, that's my work. Um, and I've recognized that in order for this action of mine to be effective, I got to live it. And that's not that easy for me. It's been a long journey. I'm still working on stuff all the time. So as I'm sharing today, I'm sharing my process. I haven't got it figured out yet, but I'm in the process. And hopefully I will give us some tools today to help everybody move forward. Right, clear speech is a common thread, and it's a directive in almost every major, in fact, in every major religion that I researched to put this talk together. How we speak, how we deliver our message is an issue of really great importance. In the Toltec tradition, they say, be impeccable with your word. Biblically, Matthew 12, 17, they say, by your words, you, you will be justified, and by you, your words, you will be condemned. In metaphysics, we recognize the power of words to create or destroy in every situation. Not only how we speak to other people and how other people speak to us, but how we speak to ourselves. And this is a big one for me. Jesus cautioned that whatever goes into our mouths, dietetically speaking, is of far less importance than what comes out of our mouths. This is a quote from Judy Picoult that kind of says it all for me. Words are like eggs dropped from great heights. You can no more call them back than ignore the mess they leave when they fall. Part of my talk today is going to be done in music, because that's my medium. And it's really dark up here, so I have to use it. I'm using my band on this so you can hear kind of what the CD sounds like. This is our world, let's fill it up with goodwill, sharing the love we feel, isn't it time to be real? Searching for truth, buried down deep inside, digging through pain and pride, finding our way through the lies. Find our way together A voice within and from above In these words our greatest treasure Messages of love Walking this path Carefully with open hearts we will seek to heal the world when we speak and when we pass if we meet eye to eye we can share love with the smile lifting us both for a while we will find our way together the voice within and from above In these words our greatest treasure Messages of
My words. Some of you know that my mother developed Alzheimer's and had it for about 10 years. And I was totally overwhelmed by the concept of my mother not having it together and me suddenly becoming the parent. And early on, when I would talk about my mom, I would express it as dealing. I got to go down to LA and deal with my mom. I have to go to the doctor and deal with my mom. I need to call the Alzheimer's Association and deal with my mom. And although people were supportive, when I suddenly had a shift of consciousness and recognized that I was now the parent of my parent and that I was not dealing with my mom, I was caring for my mom. And I started expressing that outwardly as, I'm, I'm gonna go take care of my mom today. I'm going to care for my mom. Not only did everything shift for me inside in this process, but people's reactions changed toward me. They became more loving and more supportive and more understanding. One word, dealing, caring. Words are so powerful. Now, how many of you remember coming home and having uh, a, another child call you a name? And your parents saying, oh, that's OK, honey. Sticks and stones may break your bones, but words can never hurt you. What a crock. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know where that idiom came from, but that is so wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Words can be so, so, so powerful and so hurtful. As we, as we are, help our, our children and our grandchildren, it's really important to acknowledge that, that feelings hurt. I mean, I was in two bad marriages. Alan is my third try. We just had 21 years, thank you very much. Um, and I figured a lot of stuff out. But I was physically abused in one and verbally abused in the other. And I can tell you that the verbal abuse took so much longer to heal from. Bruises heal, physical stuff heals, but for me, being torn to shreds verbally was really, really rough. And just as hurtful words can be very destructive, positive reinforcement can have the opposite effect. Um, there's a little minister, she's a unity minister, she just retired, she's 88 years old. She comes up to here on me, and I have on three inch heels. So she's a itty bitty. And she would send me her sermons like by Wednesday, and she was to talk about great with words. She could get the sermon in five sentences. And I would write a song by Saturday night for her Sunday service. 
And many times I would do the song before her talk and she would leap out of her chair, this little minute of a person, and go, that's great, now I don't have to give my sermon. <laughs> and it was so empowering for me to have that kind of positive reinforcement that I realized that this was a gift, that this is something I could offer to centers. These are, this is something I could do for my own expression to write songs that would really move ideas forward. I, it's always interesting when I'm writing my talks that always something new comes across my um, radar that's perfect. And I was looking on the internet and I wish I could find the site again because I would have liked to have shared it, but um, there's a tribe in Africa that when someone harms someone or does something wrong, Instead of imprisoning the person or punishing the person, the village creates a circle. And they put the offender in the circle. And they spend a long time reminding this person of everything good, every kind action that they've done, every gracious move. Can you imagine if we did that with kids? They reminded this offender who the essence of his real being is, how powerful this is. I, I just wish we could incorporate that into our own lives and into our education system. I'm going to give us some practical things that we can do <laughs> with words. Finding the right timing. Timing is everything. How many of you are just blown up right in the moment? Oh, none of you could. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> I used to be really guilty of that. I still am, but I'm, I'm much better at it now that I am more aware. Kids learn pretty quickly how to read body language and moods. Um, a child figures out that it's not a good time to ask to borrow the car keys right after they got a speeding ticket. It's not a good idea to ask to go to the prom if you just got caught sneaking out and you're on, and you're on restriction. And it's not usually a very good idea, and this is for all of us, to go and try and engage someone after they've just gotten in an argument with someone else. Timing, timing, timing. That also goes for if you have something that you want to share with someone, you might want to not approach them, especially if it's constructive criticism. You might want to wait. If they're in a really down place, you might not want to approach them with constructive criticism right at that moment. You might want to wait until they're feeling a little better about themselves. Number two, this is a big one for, I think, everyone. I know it's been huge for me. Spoken in truth. Being as honest as possible. I heard a lecture many, many years ago um, by Marianne Williamson, and she said, tell the truth as soon as you know it. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Do not go to your therapist, unless you really need to go to your therapist in order to work out this truth. The other thing is, as soon as you know it, and go directly to the person that you have the issue with. Don't engage other people. Don't involve other people. Don't gang up on the person that you have an issue with. Go to them, and in as loving a way as you can, share your truth. When this happens, I feel this. Not every time you, the you word is not not a good one. The words we choose are as important as the timing and the message that we're delivering. One of the directives I give myself is, in any situation that I'm uncomfortable, is what would love do here? I ask myself that first. And usually, I get a really good answer. And I can move from that place. And it, it tends to be a lot more gently, gen gently delivered. Um, speak affectionately with diplomacy, kindness, balance. Tempering our, our truth with kindness and love. And in some situations, not saying anything mm -hmm. is really the best way to handle it. If uh, we need to ask ourselves sometimes, what would be gained? by addressing this. Is, it really, is this really an important issue, or is this something I can live with? Or is this something I can, I can address differently in conjunction with something else, so we're kind of doing the whole pie? Um, this is an old English pro proverb. To talk without thinking is to shoot without aiming. <laughs> I like that one. So 
Three, spoken in a way that is beneficial to the receiver. So we can share how we feel, and sometimes it's really helpful to ask how that person is feeling. How are you feeling today? What's, you know, kind of what's up with you? You check in first. And then to really temper how we receive what a person is willing to share with us. Are we open? Are we critical? Are we understanding if someone is having a hard time expressing something deep within them? That's something that I work on a lot because I tend to interrupt. I am a uh, sentence finisher for many people, and that's been a really big one. For me, it's to, you know, I don't know what that person is going to say. It's not, maybe 90% of the time I'm right, but if 10% I'm interrupting and I'm not even on the right track, it's very um, unhelpful to whoever's trying to express their truth to me. Um, how we deliver it, how we communicate. I, I use music a lot to communicate what's going on for me, what my processes are, what my healing has been. And, and just as we try to couch our words in love, I try to couch my music in a melody that supports the feeling that I'm trying to get across in the lyrics. So it's, it's all kind of a dance. We're all composing all the time as we communicate. We know that music speaks to a different part of our brain, so trying to build a package like a program like this where hopefully the music will help get what I'm trying to share across in its own medium. Uh, speak from a place of goodwill. This is directive number five. I love the Quaker saying, say nothing unless what you have to say improves upon the silence. Could you repeat that? Say nothing unless what you have to say improves upon the silence. I've been thinking a lot about how our verbal interactions with others affect the world that we live in. That's why I love that story about the tribe in Africa. When we're really willing to do the deep work inside ourselves to get to our truths, then ex expressing it in a loving way becomes a lot easier for us because we're really grounded in, in the truth of whatever it is that we're expressing outwardly. There are many times in my life where I have reflected upon how much mileage I got out of a kind, encouraging word. I mean, I have a, a CD, my Light the Way CD was inspired by little Trish Wiseman jumping up and saying, now I don't have to give my sermon. It gave me the confidence to write in support of Wayne Dyer and Debbie Ford and a lot of other people that I had the opportunity to work with. It was, it was awesome. And to, and to have her belief in me give me the little nudge of confidence, or in my case, probably the big nudge of confidence, to trust that I had a gift and that I could use this gift effectively. That CD wouldn't ex exist, probably, without the positive response that my doing that work and writing the material that I wrote. Coming from our heart when we're sharing is probably the most important directive that I'm going to share today. Um, Rumi said, silence is the language of God. All else is poor translation. <laughs> so I love Rumi. Silence is the language of God. All else is poor translation. So if something has to be said, if we really work toward having what needs to be said, what is important to be expressed, come from a deep place inside of us, come from truth, come from our heart space. And sometimes, if there's an ongoing issue with a person, Jumping right in when it comes up can be really ineffective. Sometimes trying to figure out exactly what it is that you need to express is the most powerful path you can take. Because you can kind of move slowly and sort out what is your baggage and what is their baggage and which of your buttons are being pushed and, and which of their buttons you may inadvertently push if you don't deliver what your, your truth is to them from a place of love. Another directive that just came to me, I love it when spirit nudges me, is 
to really trust our instincts in matters of the heart and in matters of communication. It's really important. Sometimes silence is the best solution, for sure. So I would like to do a guided visualization. Are, we, are you guys up for that? So what I'd like you to do, I'm going to sing a chant. If you know it, um, please feel free to sing along. I'd like to invite you to get comfortable in your chairs, close your eyes, and I want you to quietly reflect upon how we each might use our words more kindly, more lovingly, and more effectively. The Roman century poet Publius Sirius said, I often regret that I have spoken, never that I have remained silent. The power of a word spoken from a heart at peace, touching places never reached before the word was heard. Touching places never reached before the word was heard. Power in a word spoken from an open heart, inspiring a, a brand new start with each loving word. The power of a word. The power in a Blessings, 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 blessings. 
sings I am blessed With gratitude we will embrace Each moment that we live With open hands and open hearts We'll have much more to give Blessings, blessings, blessings Blessings, blessings Blessings, blessings, I am blessed. And um, it's worked for me. My husband will see me really, you know, I got to get this CD done. And he'll go, oh, you're very dear minded about this. I'll say, yes, honey, I am. So words, made up words or misunderstood words can be very healing for us. And how many of you ever read the book, uh, Everything I Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten? A few of you. If you have not read that book, I, Robert Fulgram, this is one of his books. He also wrote Everything I Need to Know, All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. He's brilliant. <clears throat> They're perfect for people like me that are a little ADD and need short vignettes. Some of them make me laugh till I cry. This one just moved me. So I want to share a little from Robert <clears throat> this morning. Do you believe in God, Mr. Fulgram? <coughs> the journalist interviewing me has shifted scale suddenly from the details of dailiness to the definition of the divine. No, but I do believe in Howard. <laughs> Howard? You believe in Howard? It all has to do with my mother's maiden name. Your mother's maiden name was Howard. She came from a big Memphis clan that was pretty close and, we ref and was referred to as the Howard family. As a small child, I thought of myself as a member of the Howard family because it was often an item of conversation, as in, the Howard family is getting together and the Howard family thinks people should write letters to their grandmother. The matriarch, my grandmother, was referred to as Mother Howard. And you thought she was God? No, no, I just wanted you to first know how it was that Howard was a name that was important to me from early on in life. What happened was that I got packed off to Sunday school at around age four, and the first thing I learned was the Lord's Prayer, which begins, Our Father who art in Howard and in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And since little kids tend to mutter prayers, anyhow, nobody realized what I was saying. So I went right on, well, of course, he said what he heard was, Our Father who art in heaven, Howard be thy name. So he continued doing his prayer with Howard be thy name, and no one caught it. So since he was told that his grandfather had died and gone to heaven, God and my grandfather got all mixed up in my mind as one and the same, which meant that I had a pretty comfy notion about God. When I knelt beside my bed each night and prayed, Our Father, which art in heaven, Howard be thy name, I thought about my grandfather and what a big shot he was, because of course the prayer ends with, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I went to bed feeling pretty well connected to the universe for a long, long time. It was a Howard family enterprise. <laughs> You're not putting me on, are you? No, not at all. All human images of the ultimate ground of being are metaphors. And as metaphors go, this is a pretty homey one. And I thought it for so long that even when I passed through those growing up stages of skepticism, disbelief, revision, and confusion, somewhere in my mind, I still believed in Howard. Because at the heart of that childhood image, there was no alienation. I belonged to the whole big scheme of things. I lived and worked and had my being in the family store. Isn't that, I love Ron, thank you. He's actually a Unitarian minister. One of his many, I love reading his bio about what he has done and what he does. He's brilliant. I, I, if you are bummed out or if you know somebody who's bummed out, get one of his books. You can find him at secondhand stores. This one came from a secondhand store. So, <clears throat> are they in your store? Oh, get one. Get one as a gift for someone. So, no, I don't get a commission. <laughs> so anyway, sometimes misunderstanding a word can be very powerful. Look what that did for his whole childhood. Even when he was questioning his belief systems, he could go back to Howard and feeling connected. Sometimes when we're doing what Gandhi, he, Gandhi also says, use silence. Quakers, Rumi, silence. 
Sometimes a smile can be the greatest gift you can give someone, and sometimes a hug can be the greatest way to communicate with no words. So I would like to encourage all of us as we go out into the weekend and into our week to remember to try to come from always a place of love in our interactions, to speak our truth as soon as we know it, to be open and affectionate when someone is awkwardly trying to express their truth to us. And um, I think we can fill the world up with goodwill and, and use all of our words and interactions as messages of love. So thank you very much for having me today. Namaste.